having David Drake down at the end uh, introduce himself. We'll move down the line and then we'll get to the discussion. I'm David Drake. I write science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> this is going to be a kind of short panel. <laughs> I'll talk about things that are important. I am not. <laughs> uh, John Arfolds. Uh, I've written uh, several sh short stories. Uh, Weird Tales, Space and Time, Black Gate. Um, right now I have a story on lightspeedmagazine.com and uh, the Way of the Wizard anthology is coming out on November 16th. I'm Blake Charlton, and to date I've written what I consider hard fantasy. Some people don't like that term, but I like it, and I've written some hard science fiction. Uh, my name is David Bicot. Uh, I've written uh, 11 epic fantasies, uh, depending upon your definition of those. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and I most recently wrote the novelization of the uh, Ridley Scott, um, Russell Crowe Robin. Hi, I'm Frida Warrington. Um, I've written nearly 20 novels uh, of very different, different, some of which have been epic style fantasy, sword and sorcery. Um, the Abbas Citadel was a little epic but different. Um, I'm currently writing for Tor, um, uh, Elfland, and Midsummer Night, which is coming out on the 15th of November. I think it bears saying just, just as a Trivia matter that the three of us all write for the same editor at all, and it's quite interesting that we all ended up on this panel. Um, John posted on his blog not that long ago a discussion of this coming panel, um, and in part he spoke about defining epic fantasy and sword and sorcery. And I think this is something that we should discuss before we move on with the rest of the conversation, because there's a panel right after this one possibly even in this room, on sword and sorcery. And so obviously somebody's making a distinction between epic or high fantasy and sword and sorcery. And I think if we're going to discuss commercial viability or one of the other of those, we ought to first get a definition. So John, I was wondering if you might kick us off uh, talking about that a little bit. Well, it's an ongoing discussion. Um, is, is epic fantasy sword and sorcery if it features both swords and sorcery? <laughs> and, uh, and the major answer to that is no. But I hear you generally. No, no, Lord of the Rings isn't sword and sorcery. It has sword and sorcery moments, right? Conan's not high fantasy, heroic fantasy. It's sword and sorcery. So it, it's an argument that, that really there's no certain answer to it. It's kind of like, um, you know, it, well, was that a good movie or a bad movie? Well, it depends who you ask. Is that epic fantasy or sword and sorcery? It depends who you ask. But in general, the epic fantasy is, is fantasy that is epic in scope. It's... It's huge, and it's, it involves nations and armies and, and worlds, and, and it's on a vast scope. And in general, sword and sorcery, in general, is more, more on a personal scope, I think. Uh, but then again, great writers have broken those rules time and time again. Um, Moorcock's Elric series is on a vast scope, but it's definitely sword and sorcery. And, you know, uh, so there's really, it's kind of like, good writing can, can get away with breaking any of those rules, so. I don't know if there's really anything else that could be said as far as what is epic fantasy and what is sword and sorcery. Um, it's really kind of subjective. Although epic fantasy should be epic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I mean, there's there's epic, and then there's dude epic. You know. <laughs> um, for the purposes of our discussion, I feel like we, I'd like to think of epic as being alternate world as being something that's happening probably in an extended story arc. Um, I don't think, I, th I think epic fantasy, certainly commercially speaking, tends to be those series that go on for a trilogy or a quintet or an open-ended commitment to writing more books or something of that sort. A trilogy of trilogies. A trilogy of trilogies. <laughs> Do you have... Well, um, I don't know what I can add to that. Um, I mean, I, I feel that written what I consider to be epic fantasy, but I haven't included um, the, the sort of elements that have become traditional, um, such as I've never had dwarves or dragons. Um, I can't claim I haven't had elves, because I'm quite keen on elves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, 
my, my the earliest books I had published were I consider sword and sorcery, but I also think, consider them epic fantasy because they're about saving the world. So I don't know. It's blurry, which is good. I once had an argument with someone about epic fantasy always has to involve saving the world. And I argued, no, it doesn't. You could just be trying to save your own little part of the world. But again, you know, it's an argument. So I, I would actually it? agree with you on that. But at the same time, I remember when I was first uh, shopping my book around, uh, we had three editors sell us. But the world, no one's saving the world. And like it was just, it, it's one of these funny things where uh, there becomes kind of, I don't know if it's an industry expectation or a readership expectation, where there are some buttons you, you just have to hit for some industries, for some people, and you have to hit it in an interesting way. You can't make it the same thing, uh, the same end of the world. Yeah, but Conan the Conqueror, you know, the Power of the Lion, however you want to define it, uh, Conan is saving the world, but nobody, I think, I would uh, considers that epic fantasy. Uh, Sword and Sorcery is Robert E. Howard. Epic Fantasy is Tolkien. It is a continuum. And, you know, where you want to break the <coughs> continuum, I, I don't think it's an accident that Jim, uh, Robert Jordan was so very successful writing Epic Fantasy, but he had previously written half a dozen Conan pastiches. There's certainly, you know, He's not really in the middle of the continuum. He's on the Tolkien end, but certainly it wouldn't have been the same series without that. And, and speaking of that, by the way, the, the whole question, the viability. Are you going to shoot down the panel before we really get going? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I asked Tom at dinner the other night uh, how the Brandon Sanderson uh, continuations are, are doing commercially, and he said, uh, "A you know, wheel of time." And they're they, wait, wait, what? A wheel of time. Oh, wheel of time. Oh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, they've gotten the, the latest one up to I think seventy-one thousand hardcovers. Anybody in this room have a put out of seventy-one thousand hardcovers? Mm -hmm. I don't. Okay, so I think the answer to the question is. Yes, it is viable, you idiots. <laughs> and we can now adjourn to the bar. <laughs> there, there's stuff to talk about, but the question is a stupid one. Will the sun rise in the east? <laughs> All right, well... <laughs> I'm thinking no. <laughs> well, maybe the panel is, why is it still viable? Why do we love it so much? Well, I think, I think that there is a why question, too, but I think there is also a matter of, I broke in as a low mid-list writer in the mid-1990s, writing epic fantasy and turning out books that were 200,000 words long. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that today. And so I think that saying that the continuation of the Wheel of Time is viable is absolutely true, but I'm not sure that that proves the point, because the point has to have more leg than that. It has to be able to go down, and is there a viable mid-list future for epic fantasy? So Stephen King is going to continue selling books, but genre horror is dead. That's right, right, right. Okay, that, that's, okay. Sort of no, that, that's a legitimate position. I don't think it's valid in this case. But that's <laughs> <laughs> you got closer. You got closer. <laughs> I got a stay of execution. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's break down. Let's break down the subgenre a little bit into its component points. Let's talk for a minute about extended story arc and. How is extended story arc doing in the market today versus a series of standalone books? And is if epic fantasy is going to be continue to be viable for beginning writers, for middlest writers, are they going to have to look at a different way of structuring the stories that they're telling? Looking and I'm, I'm, looking, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at anyone. That's, yeah, that, that's actually a really good point. Because um, I've, you know, I've wondered how far you can stray from the 
you know, the real cliches of, of fantasy, the, the elves, the dwarves, the, the orcs, the dragons, etc., etc., and still have a really, you know, commercially successful product. Uh, product. Product is the right word, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that was a bit of a If we're story. talking commercial, product is yeah. the right word. Yeah. Um, I wrote a trilogy, uh, The Abbas Citadel, the Sapphire Throne, The Obsidian Tower, which. Um, I, I, wanted, I wanted it to be an epic fantasy in order to, you know, do reasonably well, but at the same time I wanted to try and avoid all the cliches of epic fantasy, um, which I don't know whether I succeeded, um, but, you know, I, I, I'm really interested to know how far you can stray away from what the readers seem to expect um, and still be successful with it. Um, and the, pro the problem I found with publishers is that they'll really push the first book, but when the second book comes out, when the third book comes out, they won't make quite so much effort. And the readers go to the shop and they can't, they, they can find book two or they can find book three, but because they can't find book one, they won't buy it. Um, so what I'm doing now is um, standalone books, although they're linked by the same background and some of the characters cross over each story is separate and they might weave together a little bit but I'm trying to keep each one separate so you can just pick anything up and I don't know if that's the way to go but it's the way I'm trying to go it's actually the way I'm going with my next project as well and that's what I've always done uh, remember I started out writing short stories for magazines you know the I, I became famous famous for the Hammer Slammer series as a matter of fact, the Hammer Slammer series became famous. I did not. <laughs> no, no, no that, that's really true. I, I had a case in the 80s where I was introduced uh, to a sales manager. And, hi, this is David Drake. He wrote Hammer Slammers. Oh! <laughs> and, but these were written from magazines. And the fact there was a story in the October issue uh, and there was another story in the January issue of the next year. There was absolutely no reason to assume that the reader of the January issue would have read the October, the previous October issue. Every story had to be a standalone. And it was nonetheless a series. Uh, and, and this was standard. I mean, it, it's not that I invented this or anything. but. There is no reason you can't have a consistent series in which every element is a standalone, and I've, I've tried to do that. Uh, will you get more if you read the whole thing? Well, yes, if I've done it right. But do you have to read the whole thing? And I, I've been really pleased when people have told me, oh, you know, I just read such and such, and I really liked it. And I said, did you know that that's the second book of the trilogy? No, was it? <laughs> and that's exactly the right reaction. Uh, you know, so I've, I've been doing this for a long time, and no, it's not a new problem. Now, Blake, your series is more of an extended story arc, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, so I've only written a book, so I probably shouldn't make too many generalizations. <laughs> <laughs> the second one's about to come out this well, summer. There, but, there you go. You're an but so it is an extended story arc, but what, uh, what I'm really interested in doing is trying to take epic fantasy and uh, kind of mash it up with, with some different things. So there's a lot of uh, scientifically based, uh, so there's a magic system which is very heavily scientifically based, but uh, talking about story arc and the extended story arc, uh, I get actually pretty bothered by this series that like propose to Epic and then flirt with Endless at the like rehearsal dinner. That drives me nuts. So every single one of my books takes a place over like three or four days, uh, and for and I get some heat about that. You can't have Epic Fantasy that doesn't last, you know, for long amounts of time. Some people say, uh, but you know, I I read a lot of murder mysteries and thrillers, and they take place in three or four days, and. You know, you don't need to travel to the far north and wait two months to, to find the next. And you can uh, read clip. one Miss Marple mystery and not know there were 50 others. Or however many there are. You know, that, there's no, that's a perfectly viable form in has been in lots of genres. 